Uh, let me uh, just follow up on that very interesting question that was posed. The, the, uh, rhetorical? I'm not sure why you thought it was rhetorical. Rhetorical meaning that I think we're, a lot of people are probably thinking the same thing and wondering how we would even go about organizing all of that information because yeah. the information comes from so many sources. Be, it's a big job. So uh, I, I have a few comments and the others might as well. Uh, we've always thought of ourselves in the office as being a repository for information. The information that we originally thought we were planning to uh, provide was information for scientists. So we developed a systematic review approach to the efficacy and safety of supplements, not because we were trying to promote or slam, but rather we had the recognition that there were gaps in knowledge and we could be part of identifying where the best research efforts could take place. Uh, and so our systematic reviews uh, on a, a range of nutrients, ephedra, by the way, was the first one I'm, uh, Carol Hagens mentioned it, uh, but vitamin D, multivitamins, and so on. Goal there was to identify gaps in knowledge. Uh, again, not to, to support or slam, but to say, look, we, we have a lack of information here. And at the end of the day, we care most about what consumers are being exposed to. So uh, this followed on that our uh, uh, evidence-based approach began to uh, infect our fact sheets uh, that were aimed at consumers. But then a third thing has happened over the last few years, and this hasn't really been uh, directly addressed today or this week. A systematic review approach to uh, nutrition, or this part of nutrition, and then nutrition more generally, has been a rocky road. Um, uh, I'm not saying that we invented it, but we were among the first um, roadkill uh, when it came to uh, incorporating systematic review tools into nutrition topics. But gradually, the field has become as infected as we were by uh, systematic review approaches. And it's an approach. It's not making medical decisions for, for nutritional topics, but rather that we're using the tools that are available to all fields to address challenging, often opinion-rich areas like nutrition. The way I describe it is that 100% of us eat right, so 100% of us have an opinion on, on nutrition. Some of the opinions are worth listening to, um, and some of them will remain opinions and they'll always be personal. Others, however, have to, frame, uh, have to be used to frame public health decision making, and that's where we've evolved uh, as, a, uh, as a place where um, tools are being used to address public health issues. Uh, I do take some credit on behalf of the office for having been uh, very much involved in the application of systematic review tools for the development of nutrition policy, nutrition specifically dietary reference intakes for vitamin D and calcium. Um, it, uh, and the tool is now in process for being used to uh, assess uh, the, uh, reassess the dietary reference intake values for sodium and potassium. So there's a head of steam going. And my point in saying all of this is that we've always felt as though we were in a position to be able to offer uh, tools, advice, guidance as people make decisions. Is it whether it's consumers, uh, whether it's uh, uh, developers of clinical practice guidelines, or developers of clinical of public health guidelines. So that's the broad uh, area where we think we're making a difference, and what you described exactly fits into that. Did that answer your question? Yes, uh, thank you. And I, I guess I was, I was thinking kind of specifically of branding things as clinical practice guidelines. Well. Um, uh, you know that there are clinical practice guidelines for managing vitamin D. Mm -hmm. You know that they are 
fairly broad. There is not agreement among them, for example. But the process that is leading to them is an evidence-based one. At the end of the day, people are going to make decisions, and they, they'll be making decisions based on uh, evidence that may be rich, may be poor, may be all over the place. A systematic review approach allows you to take those pieces that are amenable to putting in the evidence box. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to take what's in the box plus whatever else you know in uh, making decisions. So we're trying to help with the what can we put in the box uh, that's relevant to us. Anything uh, that you folks wanted to add to that? Other comments or questions from people? A couple of you look as though you're ready to hit so the, the, hit the, the button. The purpose of this panel is really any questions that you may have thought of throughout the course of the event. And, and so anything is fair game here. If there's any clarity that we can provide to you before we set you free, now is the time. Uh, you have all of our contact information, of course, should you think of something on your way home or, or something arises later in your career. But this specifically, anything um, that's been covered, you are welcome to ask questions about. Uh, sort of a half question. I have the analysis for the adverse event reports on the FNF and stuff done. So. Feel free to catch me afterwards if you're interested. Okay, that's Merle Zimmerman from the American Herbal Products Association. Yes. Uh, I had a question about how long uh, the binder is gonna be uh, accessible to those of us who need to get some additional information online that we can't download. Yeah, th that information will never go away. So that link will always work for you. I have a question about, it's kind of like about bioequivalence. You said something in your talk about how like if one product doesn't work for you, go try another one. And you know, a bunch of them might have a similar product in them that works the same. And are you guys working in any way to maybe put information about bioequivalence like into that box that we may then be able to go on and use? When we do our fact sheets on typically individual ingredients, we look for all of that information that we can find. We look for the different kinds of forms and if there's any effect on you know, absorption, whether or not it should be taken with meals, that sort of thing, as well as uh, bioequivalence. I have to tell you that uh, that information is, for many uh, ingredients, very difficult to uh, come by, or really only uh, 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 available in very small kinds of studies where we really don't know uh, uh, how generalizable uh, that is. We're actually, we're completing a fact sheet on biotin. Uh, why did I use that as an example? As it turns out, we were having trouble really uh, identifying how do you even assess biotin status, or should you? What should the blood levels be? What should the urinary values be? Is it even, uh, what are the metabolites? Uh, is it even, uh, uh, you know, can you even do an assessment in that way? Uh, and we've, had to uh, go to outside experts and say basically what we can find, what is uh, written, is very insufficient and inadequate. We don't know whether we scoured the, the literature appropriately. Can you help us? And basically two or three of our outside reviewers who have weighed in have basically said, no, you got what's there. Uh, so often it's difficult to do, but we're looking for that information and we try to include it when we can. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hey. Um, I first want to thank the ODS for putting this very fantastic um, workshop. Um, so thank you. I hope my question is not off the topic, but um, hearing all these great presentations, one thing came to me is um, that the consumers um, didn't intend to tell the physicians when they use the supplements, and there also appeared that the physicians may not have talked to their patients about use of the supplements. So I wonder whether you have any comments or thoughts about how to enhance this communication between physicians and consumers or patients as you show that physician played a great role, right, in adv um, advising 
which supplements you to use or whether they should use supplements. Thank you. So that is a really good point. We know that most consumers, at least from the little evidence that we have, don't think of supplements as medications. So when physicians or healthcare practitioners say, please list your medications, they don't consider it in that context. And similarly, I don't know of many efforts that have been undertaken to educate physicians to ask. I have noticed in uh, more recent uh, encounters personally that they are now asking, do you take any medications or dietary supplements? So I think that the word is getting out there, um, but I don't know of any specific educational tools or programs uh, specifically directed at that. I would also add, too, that uh, in fact, it was one of the uh, slides that uh, Johanna showed about why people aren't telling their practitioners about their dietary supplement use because they didn't ask, didn't think it was appropriate, et cetera. What that study also showed, if, we're think if I'm thinking of the right one, is that things have gotten better in that of all the different kinds of uh, CAM modalities for dietary supplement use, that was the most common use of a CAM therapy for which the patient was likely to, to tell the uh, uh, physician or the, the healthcare provider, something like in three or four cases, so it was up to 75%. If that's truly the case, that is, uh, is wonderful. But as many have said, and as we reiterate, it's very important uh, that uh, you uh, engage the uh, patient, the individual, the person that you're meeting, that you ask the question and see what you can, what, what you can get, what kind of conversation you can engage in. And, the more willing they are to talk, the more willing you are to spend a little bit of uh, time with them. I think for many people on the whole, that can work some wonders. And then there are those for, because of their worldview or whatever, are going to take the supplements anyway. Sometimes the best you can do is to acknowledge that and accept it, and your role then becomes making sure that what they're doing is safe that it is not going to uh, potentially negatively interact with other medications or so on that they may be taking, that the dose isn't a uh, uh, possibly a dangerous one, et cetera. And you have those conversations when you need to, but otherwise you sort of steer the patient so that if they're going to continue taking them, you're going to do your best to, to keep them out of any potential trouble. Yes, if I may just yeah. add to that, I apologize, um, not an expert in any means, but if most interdisciplinary teams, I'm up here, sorry. <laughs> um, most interdisciplinary teams have a dietitian on board and those dietitians are trained to ask those questions and to ask the amounts they're taking and to ask about, extensively about those things, so use your dietitian. Was that a plug? Yes. <laughs> Good. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. There's a question up front but, here, and then there's okay. one back Actually, there. Actually, mine is a comment also. So yeah. I'll, I'll make a plug for pharmacists then in terms of asking those Good questions. For you. And um, I think the. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, in addition to not realizing that it's important to tell, I think one of the things we see is that they don't want to tell because they fear disapproval. And so um, I think one of the things that we we teach pharmacy students is you have to be non-judgmental. Your information gathering and then the follow-up to that is to tell them why it's important to know because they may still be reluctant to tell you even if you're trying to be non-judgmental but you have to tell them that you, as you said, that um, you want to be sure it's, there's no interaction or the things. So if you tell them what the benefit is to them, they're certainly a lot more likely to share what they're taking. Yeah, I think another um, challenge that we face is that when they do tell, that the electronic medical records right now are not always uh, allowing the multi-ingredient composition of some of these dietary supplements, and so there's no way for them to really cross-talk in, in a lot of our safeguarding to check drug herb, drug nutrient interactions. Um, and so I think that's one of the challenges we're facing in the marketplace. 
That's actually interesting because, again, more and more people taking products that have uh, multiple ingredients, it's one thing to note in their chart that they're taking a centrum, which you generally have an idea of what's in it, but not, you know, if you put down Xanthrex X or, you know, Alien Plus 2, yeah, uh, et cetera, they're not going to know what that is. And if you can't take the time to put in the, you know, 6 to 96 ingredients in that product and the amount, it's really going to mean nothing and probably ignored by someone else who's looking at the record. Yeah, it's often ignored by physicians and only if a pharmacist has a chance or a time to go digging into what the ingredients are is it actually applicable. The, uh, the context for my question is that I always have a tab running in the background of my mind thinking about easy targets for secondary data analysis. So um, when people are keeping track of their diet, for instance, there's a de facto standard like MyFitnessPal, right? There are many, but that's, that's one of the big ones. Is there a supplement tracker that, that has emerged as a de facto standard? The office used to have an app um, called MyDS that would help um, consumers to track what they were taking and then use that as a tool for communications with their healthcare providers. But unfortunately, it was um, a program that was um, cut during uh, financial slashing of the government budget. <laughs> I guess I would ask our, uh, any of the, uh, the pharmacists, uh, are there any tracking tools you know of for medication use that would be amenable to including information about supplement intake? And again, particular products or particular ingredient uh, combinations with multiple ingredients. That's a, actually, that's a good question to ask, Paul, and maybe it's stimulating some thought uh, because uh, the need for a specific supplement tracker was, we, we didn't find a huge use of it. But if those data could be captured in other tracking systems, that would be a great advance. So pharmacists, please think about. Uh, I think we come back to the question of the databases and how that uh, they use like first data bank, a lot of these drug trackers do. And so if there's not a database that's merging some of these multi-ingredient supplements, we're not going to have that crosstalk. It's free text. And then the free text has mm -hmm. its own limitations on that process. Uh, so it, it does sound like it's an area that, that still wants to be further developed. Yes, The only thing I can add on that is natural database does have a lot of multi um, combination ingredients. So for many of the products we use at our store, we just put in the name brand of it and it'll print up the 15 ingredients. So that may be a place to start because they already have that in their database. There could be a consumer version so they could track it. We also have the, uh, the dream, maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, that our dietary supplement uh, label database will somehow be able to be encapsulated in a uh, mobile and maybe even put into the, uh, the medical record where uh, we'll have virtually all of the, uh, the labels. So you enter the, uh, the product name, company, or what have you, and uh, there it will be. And also, too, because the DSLD maintains a historical record, even of supplements that are no longer in the market or as they've changed their formulation, unlike the supplement owl, let's say. Um, uh, it could possibly be used for that. But again, it's a, it's a dream at this point. So we're on version two. Stay tuned for maybe version, I don't know, five, six, ten. Yeah, the twenty. I'll be around for that. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I just feel the need to make a plug for nursing. <laughs> good, good. We have to represent. Um, but I do feel like... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do feel like our nursing, um, our nurses and our nursing students are the ones oftentimes that are taking the histories and collecting the information about the medications that patients are taking. And I know something that we teach them often is instead of asking, do you take, to just rephrase the wording of which ones do you take. And that oftentimes helps. Good. Uh, are there any other disciplines that would like to be acknowledged? Yes. So, so this is uh, so we heard plugs from nursing, 
uh, dietitians yeah. and from pharmacists, pharmacists yeah. you know. So that's great. I mean, all of those have to be involved with uh, patient practitioner communication, right? You know, we, we need to have that. But I want to make a plug for um, basic researchers and other academic staff. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so one instance where this sort of comes up, I'd say, is uh, you know a very related uh, and salient paradigm is uh, the investigation of uh, urban uh, traditional medicine use and and medical ethnobotany going on in cities. And there are, there are people investigating this. Um, one good example who I know, uh, Joanna Michael graduated from my program and uh, she's currently working at the UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago Medical School, working with MD students in training to get them to realize, oh, well, in Chicago, there are plenty of botanicas, you know. There are people in the area who are using traditional medicine all the time, but because of, you know, the paradigms in Western medicine in terms of the way you know, communication has traditionally gone down in the clinic. Uh, people won't necessarily volunteer this information. They don't think to. And so getting students to sort of think about this uh, as a, a very important issue uh, is, is good. And, um, and then there's also people like Michael Balick and his colleagues uh, that are investigating, you know, uh, herbs that uh, Dominican healers are using in New York City and, um, Oh, and in, in Chicago also at the Field Museum, there's Alika Wali, and she's, a, she's an anthropologist, but she has done some work uh, going to botanicas, going to uh, traditional Chinese medicine apothecaries and uh, corner stores that are s uh, selling Ayurvedic uh, remedies and documenting those, curating them, and trying to learn more about how they're used in communities. So that's sort of, I guess, I, I think something that could be thought about as related to this issue. Good, thank you. Thanks. Sir. One other profession uses a lot of, of herbs and dietary supplements are chiropractors. Yeah, yeah. And, and so they... that's a little shout out to everybody in my profession. <laughs> <laughs> also the naturopathic physicians who are the most trained in <laughs> herb supplement interactions and nutrient depletions of pharmaceuticals, so. I am so glad that you're all here, yes. Yeah, I'd like to say when you're doing studies of herbal medicine, consult with an herbalist. Yeah. So a lot yeah. of the studies, I, I don't know if you were here the other day, but uh, the St. John's Worth study on ADHD, when I show it to herbalists, they say, well, of course it doesn't work for ADHD. Um, and there were no herbalists on the study team who could have uh, talked about that. Yeah. And this is a field, as I mentioned very early on, that, uh, that touches a great many disciplines and uh, we benefit from having the input and experience of, of all of you. Are there other qu questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. As an MD, um, I'm an integrative medicine doctor, and uh, um, the patients often don't know what they're taking or they guess at the name, so it's really helpful if you encourage them to bring the bottles in with them. Even yeah. if they take a picture of the bottle, I often don't know what the ingredients are. Good. This is this is very, very helpful. Yes, ma'am. I guess I would add another one is from the patient perspective. So I'm a researcher, but I um, work with patient stakeholders as a PCORI grant I'm working with. So they indicated they would very much like resources that can you know, be delivered, they can access hopefully remotely, perhaps due to my lack of knowledge. I don't know whether there are existing resources about supplement use that patients can access to or perhaps there's future directions to go to give or provide some resources the patient can use, be educated mm -hmm. in a sense. Well, I think there's probably a collection of them and we'll do the plug. I mentioned this at the very beginning that the, our dietary supplement uh, ODS website contains a lot of patient-oriented and, and public-oriented information. It's not the only place. Uh, to get it, but it's also a portal to uh, quite a number of other resources. I, can't, I have to tell you, I continue to be impressed with a number that says there are 1.6 pe million people who visit our website every month. And mo many of them are going to those fact sheets that Paul Thomas and others have, have referred to because they're starting to see that they're, we are finally meeting a need, I think, that has been there for a long time. Uh, and I'm pleased that we're going to be part of that. 
Yes, ma'am. How often are the fact sheets updated? Paul, do you want to comment on that? How, are they, how often are they updated? Um, well. <laughs> I've asked that too, Honestly, haven't I? <laughs> well, not often enough, but we are trying to remedy that. Um, in fact, we have uh, put a process into place that um, every uh, two years, all of our fact sheets will get a, a thorough going over. But that doesn't mean that it, that, um, the content in between or for even longer periods is ignored. Every day uh, we look at, uh, we find out or hear about new journal article comes out and so on. So we're looking at new information about dietary supplements. And when uh, there is a paper out that would seem to be significant or we want to, would want to include it in our fact sheets uh, right away, we do it. We, we, make a, uh, we make a quick revision. But all of that literature that we collect on, say, vitamin D, or we, we sort of uh, keep the most important stuff we update the fact sheet with. And then when it undergoes its uh, major review, and again, within a two-year period, uh, all that other literature will be looked at and possibly used as, uh, as uh, references. We understand the need and uh, the value of keeping them as up-to-date as uh, possible. And with our team, we do the, uh, the, the best we can. But we're always uh, paying attention to the most important uh, literature that has the greatest implications for the kinds of practical informative information we'd want for uh, uh, the reader. And we'll include that as soon as possible when we receive it. So I had a couple of comments. Did you, uh, was there a question up here? Yes, go ahead. Hello, so I'm a periodontist. I feel like I need to ask a question. <laughs> so I would like to ask um, the position of the office for patients or subjects not taking any supplements. What's your position on, would you recommend to try, learn to try, or would you recommend them not to try given there's an absence of evidence? Because what I feel like, we just don't have enough evidence for a guideline. And, as a practitioner, where a lot of us in contact with the patient, the bottom line, we still care with the patient's outcome, the patient or subject sitting in front of us. And what's your comment on this? So I, I'll, I'll, make an, I'll offer one up, and the answer is yes and no. And uh, uh, there is, uh, I remember the uh, conclusion of one of the s systematic reviews that we sponsored on multivitamins and chronic disease prevention, which basically ended with the Remark, if you're, if you're taking multivitamins, there's no reason to stop. If you're not taking multivitamins, there's not really any reason to start. Did I get that right, Johanna? Yeah. And that, um, it's such a personal decision. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to respond to. We're, we're not making recommendations one way or the other. Uh, Paul made uh, some very specific recommendations or recognizing that as we grow older, uh, we absorb less B12 from our diets, so there's a reason to want to add more B12 in, in more bioavailable forms. Uh, folate, uh, calcium at various stages and ages. But uh, for the most part, uh, an adequate diet ought to be the starting point, and for some it's the only point. Um, one of the nice things about most dietary supplements under most conditions of use is that they're safe. The problem is that under some conditions of use for some people and at some levels, they're not safe. How do you know? So uh, what we want is to have a very informed consumer and an informed healthcare provider uh, who can help consumers to, uh, to make those decisions. At the end of the day, they're gonna make them their, themselves. We hope we're providing resources that can uh, guide both a healthcare provider and consumer in making those kinds of choices. I wanted to do two things before uh, we leave. One, could I ask all of the members of the Office of Dietary Supplements staff to stand up? Up there, up there, all of you, you. Um, and I want them, all of us, to thank you for being here. We really, really enjoy your participation in these events. Uh, we get to know a little bit more about you. We hope that you get to know more about us. 
we want you to consider us as a resource. The other thing I'd like to do is to ask that uh, you all think about, have you made contacts uh, with colleagues here, uh, either within the Office of Dietary Supplements or uh, among yourselves? Because I think I said something at the beginning about my hoping that you will make connections among yourselves uh, so that we will feel that we're helping to build a cadre of knowledgeable people who are gonna go out and uh, do uh, more research, uh, counsel more patients, uh, do uh, the, the, the right kinds of uh, interventions for people, uh, and that in the process that you, you find this a satisfying uh, and enjoyable area of endeavor to be in. So uh, uh, do you folks have any other comments you wanted to make? All right, well, I wanted to thank uh, uh, all of you for being here. Safe travels. Uh, oh, I did have one more comment to make, and that was that this is the last year that Reagan Bailey is going to be the director of this course. We've kicked her out. She's out of here now. Uh, Reagan will always be a member of uh, our family, and she will continue as a, an advisor to this, uh, this practicum, but uh, uh, Luis uh, 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 will be the um, uh, course director from here on out, and uh, she will be continuing to be the contact with uh, those of your colleagues who want to come to the practicum in the future. Uh, with that said, thanks.